my loves, I'm Honeybat, and today I want to talk to you about one of my favourite games of all time, The Cat Lady. I find myself coming back to this game every time I'm in a depressive slump, and it always gives me a real sense of catharsis. That's without even mentioning the amazing story and character arcs, the striking art style and excellent sound design. But what do I mean by catharsis? Well. When we think about depression in media, we often get gritty, hashtag relatable portrayals of people in sweatpants lounging on a couch, arms six inches deep in a Pringles tube, or wayfish girls with smudged mascara posing by fogged up windows. You know, deep stuff. On social media, there's blogs dedicated to quotes on how terrible or fake the world is, and how terrible we are for doing nothing about it. And given the constant stream of negative news, I totally get it. How powerless we are. How tired we are. How broken the world is. There's this underlying obsession that nobody can truly understand the depths of, or fully express the raw pain of just being. There's the memification of depression too. You know, your friend will share a post like this. Or maybe this. With a caption like, mood. And you laugh. Or let's be real, you blow some air out your nose without really thinking about it too hard, because yeah, it's far easier to deal with negative emotions through humour. And it confirms in your mind that this is normal. It's fine to feel like this. It's relatable. I literally went on Facebook and scrolled for less than two minutes to find these, by the way. And you know, to a degree, this is fine. Overanalyzing your day-to-day -day posting starts to feel weirdly existential, and sometimes it just isn't that deep but you can't ignore the way you feel validated by these throwaway posts, and it's a socially acceptable method of expression when you really do want to vent or convey how tired or stressed you feel. It confirms you're not alone. There's a sense of camaraderie in this capitalist hellscape, but it can start to creep into your internal monologue too, calling yourself an idiot when you mess up, believing that something went wrong because it's you of course it went wrong. You've probably heard of positive affirmations, and while it may sound cringeworthy to give yourself little pep talks, they're recommended for a reason, and that's because perception really does shape your world. I'm one of those people who has a real mental stumbling block when it comes to self-care uwu posts, but we're not talking about me, it, it's fine. What depressed people need is actual support. Not platitudes, not the logical dismissal of your emotions, like, when did someone telling you to stop acting like it's the end of the world, or it's not really that bad ever make you feel better? Not encouraging the spiral, though leaning into the curve of a bad day from time to time with a tub of ice cream for company isn't exactly a crime. Catharsis comes from doing something with that feeling, whether it's some time with a punch bag, cooking, writing, or chatting with a friend. Especially the latter, as when you're caught up in your own head, you may not actually need to hear a solution. You might already have one but you do need to be understood. Implementing the solution can wait five minutes, and you'll probably make a worse job of it if you're still stewing with anger or upset, resenting that you have to be in this situation in the first place. Catharsis comes from moving forward mentally and physically, and that's what this game is to me, Catharsis. Part one, the house in the woods. When I first found the cat lady, it was through a YouTube Let's Play in 2013, and I just… couldn't take it. The opening monologue of our protagonist, Susan, reading her own suicide note after overdosing was not something I was prepared for as a young teen struggling with her own mental health and self-isolation, despite the game putting a very clear warning before the menu. I'm a huge fan of horror, especially psychological, and believed that naturally I, as a mature horror connoisseur, would have no problems but the initial oppressive atmosphere really got to me. Susan is a middle-aged recluse who takes care of the local cats. She's unemployed, has no human friends to speak of, and feels abandoned by the world. And so at the end of another monotonous day, she overdoses on a bottle of sleeping pills. Her suicide transports her spirit to a deeply saturated dream world, a sickly yellow barley field with minimalist, soft piano in the background. Initially, it looks like the peaceful death she'd yearned for, but the world uses a breadcrumb trail of Susan's own corpse to lead her to its host, the Queen of Maggots. Welcome to my house, Susan Ashworth. The Queen, who by her rank, reverby voice and ambiguously odd accent, is presented as a figure of otherworldly power. 
She claims to know Susan well, and though her true identity is never neatly pinpointed in game, it takes Susan a journey to hell and back to recognise her for what she is. The Queen blackmails Susan into murdering five parasites for her, justifying it as gardening. If there were weeds amongst the flowers, you'd pull them out, wouldn't you? She even presents this opportunity to return to life as a gift to Susan, telling her that while these serial killers are alive, then she can't die. Immortality. So the driving force of the plot is ransoming a severely depressed middle-aged woman to go on a killing spree, or doom herself to an eternity of misery. That's... sure something. And I love that something. It's painted by the Queen as a sort of revenge quest, to rid the world of selfish humans on her behalf, and call Susan a dark angel, but for Susan it sounds abhorrent. The deeper in she gets though, the more cathartic it becomes, as she's able to tackle the sorts of people that help to poison her life. I also really appreciate that Susan is middle-aged too. It's refreshing not to be in charge of a chirpy girl, edgy boy, or grizzled man, and it demonstrates how painfully drawn out her struggle's been. She didn't magically get better over time, and her main appearance throughout the game has her looking younger than her initial dead sprite. A new lease of life, perhaps. Time grants the space to grow, but to use the Queen's gardening analogy, you have to break up the hardened soil and all those ingrained bad habits. Plant new ambitions and water them, give them support and help them grow. You can't just lump in some affirmations and call it good. Sometimes you have to rip out what's already grown, even if it hurts to grow something new that's rooted in healthier soil. It takes work, but running a wheelbarrow down the same path over and over carves that path in deep. Soon it becomes the only path for it at all, and the Queen is going to leave a Susan out of her rut whether she wants it or not. The gardening metaphor the Queen uses is deliberately cruel, not only in making mass murder more palatable, but because the Queen knows how much Susan hates flowers. Throughout the first half of the game, Susan often comments on her pathological hatred of flowers, but they seem to follow her everywhere. The Queen is holding a bouquet when she waits for Susan, telling her she's going to leave them on her coffin. They're in the hospital ward, where she has to recover from her overdose. They're in the crow's other world, when Susan dies and are touted as a reward for solving his puzzle, before they're crumbled into ash, and he mocks her for thinking there'll be any special reward for her of all people. To Susan, flowers are lost happiness, and a painful reminder of her dead daughter, Zoe. More on her later. But at the outset, the player has no idea of the implications flowers have to Susan, and it just feels a bit… odd. The Queen subtly mocks Susan for her daughter's death as well. She says, almost compassionately, that I was standing right behind you when you threw away all those photographs, you know? I brushed your hair every night you cried yourself to sleep. Given her greeting and funeral bouquet, she consciously positions herself as empathetic, her actions plausibly kind. Replaying the game with added context really demonstrates her insidious cruelty, and it's pretty uncomfortable. Whether she truly harbours any sympathy for Susan is debatable, and I sincerely doubt it. But she does need a reliable person to strong arm into doing her dirty work. After years of feeding on her, the Queen knows how to twist all of Susan's determination and stubbornness into self-destruction. Much like depression makes monotony and numbness feel safe, the Queen has no true comfort to offer, and she can't resist twisting the knife at every opportunity. She quietly confirms to Susan that, I know what you want, but it's not here, it's gone, and it will never, ever come again. Then shows her images of her own body crucified in her daughter's bedroom as Susan pleads to be anywhere but here. That's not to say Susan's powerless. No matter how often she feels the situation is against her, sometimes rationally, sometimes not, she always rises to the challenge. She's resourceful, sarcastic, weather beaten by experience, and takes no shit from anyone. She has an absolutely unshakable inner strength, and a perseverance that shines through whether she's building a weapon out of abandoned tools in a museum of corpses, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that, or dragging herself through the daily routine of showering and making coffee. What she truly lacks, though, is a friend. Part 2. Talking Therapy So, Susan wakes up from her little nap after a sacrifice of soul and a sacrifice of blood. Which you may or may not have had instruction for, depending whether or not you listened to the Queen back in her dimension. Every time Susan is killed from here on out, she'll return to life, whether she wants to or not. 
But as the game goes on, it seems these frequent resets weaken her connection to life. As her life improves, her will to live gets stronger, but the other world keeps her for longer each time she visits, adding additional puzzles and obstacles to make it harder to return. I suppose you can have too much death. In the hospital, Susan bonds with a chatty nurse named Liz, a bright, bubbly young woman who's utterly fed up with her job and how little anyone cares about her. If you've ever been in the mental health system, you probably already know how this is going to pan out. It's… not great. Susan is consistently waved away by doctors and nurses as being attention-seeking, a nuisance for asking questions, and forcibly drugged when she does something difficult like ringing the help bell in the toilet. Susan is entirely powerless in this place, but Liz brightens her stay by sharing her own story, and the game actually tests you on how well you've listened to her when she later takes her life on the roof of the hospital. Susan's attitudes have changed too, with her telling Liz that she doesn't want her to make the same mistake she did and go through with the suicide. Though you, a stranger, can't save her, you can make her final moments better, and she expresses the wish that the two of them could have been friends, but unfortunately she actually met her fate long before meeting Susan. Liz is never acknowledged by anyone else in the hospital, except by her killer, and it's likely that her presence is only due to the Queen of Maggot's influence, but her ghost is brought back to show Susan how important listening to someone's experiences is to them. It seeds the idea that talking to someone about her problems might just help her begin to feel better. Learning by living is definitely trial by fire here. There's no real mechanical consequence to not listening to Liz, bar missing a key on her corpse which allows you to bypass the section's parasite. Theoretically, this'll doom far more victims, but it doesn't actually change the game's story, and it continues as if Susan killed him, so it's likely not a canon decision. What Liz's death does do is tell Susan how it feels to be the one left behind, to bear the guilt of not noticing someone struggling or dismissing their problems as lesser than your own. The parasite in question, currently in charge of her psychiatric care, asks her if she'd imagined her own funeral, and how she'd hoped people might react to her death. Depending on dialogue choices, Susan seems either bitter or resigned, hoping to show people how hurt she really was, and pictures her grave being left unattended and choked with weeds, yet she deliberately isolated herself in life. In her own words, Everywhere I turn there are people filled with hope and will to live. Or people so pitiful, they make me ashamed to be alive. Perhaps someone could have made time to listen to the crazy cat lady, Perhaps she could have let someone in. Perhaps she could have done the same for someone like Liz. The other supporting relationship in Dime Ward, or Die Ward, as Liz calls it, is Anne Burton, who's there voluntarily for heroin addiction and can leave whenever she chooses. Susan, on the other hand, needs a discharge letter to ensure she's been seen by a doctor and is deemed safe enough to go home. In frustration at being routinely dismissed by the staff, she gives up on the conventional approach and decides to switch name bounds with Anne, as they look similar enough that an inattentive receptionist wouldn't be likely to notice till it was too late. Doing so means literally seeing things through Anne's eyes, listening to her story and taking the same drugs as her before passing through a mirror to get her the red stuff, a treat for good behaviour from the nurses. She needs to prove she's a friend to Anne by naming her mother, Something that can only be done by looking at the hospital bathroom mirror both sober and drugged to find both parts of the name. The game gives you a list of options to guess at, but the correct answer doesn't even appear until Susan actively works to discover it. This also means that if you follow a guide or try to speed through the game, you can't simply whiz past by remembering the name. Time and attention has to be given to her, something the hospital staff simply don't have the time or energy to do, consistently fobbing off patients or drugging them to keep them docile and removing any sense of agency. At the beginning of the chapter we find Susan used to be a nurse herself, and both she and Liz seem utterly disillusioned with the healthcare system. The staff cannot allow themselves to care about patients because they have such a high turnover rate and little time or resources to offer patients thanks to lack of funding, rushed schedules and exhaustingly long shifts underpaid and overworked. Please, fund the NHS for the love of fuck. Anywho, after having a snaffle of red stuff, the hospital becomes nightmarish with the elastic beating of a spider's heart pumping drugs through the flesh of the hospital. The organ appears parasitic in itself, skewered onto the ceiling with sharp metal limbs and piercing the infrastructure. Susan has to slash it open to collect the red stuff for Anne, which causes it to beat faster under the strain and splash drugs onto the floor. 
This is illustrative of the endless drugging of patients, propping up a lack of time and therapy with pharmaceuticals instead of addressing both the root of the issue as well as the chemical imbalances in a patient's brain. This leads to damaging cycles of addiction, which lend themselves to prolonged suffering, such as Anne's indefinite hospitalisation. The real powerhouse of the psych ward, though, is Dr. X. Liz warns Susan about his lack of discretion towards anyone as long as they're wearing a skirt, and the chapter jumps between his psychiatric evaluation of Susan and her escape attempt. Time in this game is often muddled and interspliced around a central location or conversation, slowly circling around the problem at hand until Susan can fully realise the big picture. The first parasite, Dr. X, has the power to decide which patients are considered safe enough to leave, which medications are appropriate, and he evaluates each patient personally to bring their minds back to their former beauty. He's presented as a sophisticated gentleman, softly spoken and well respected in his field with a keen interest in fine art, but despite his professional posturing, he's far more concerned with selecting his next victim. He feeds on the hospital system, singling out the vulnerable patients, staff and cleaners, presenting them with a caring face whilst assessing their potential to become part of his art gallery in the disused hospital wing. He hangs up their corpses and poses them with wire to mimic classical art, needing to replace his models as they rot. His questions are probing not only to understand the lives of his patients, but to find women with no support network, who can use him as a surrogate friend and make them dependent on his care, and who most importantly, have nobody to miss them or file a report. Social isolation leads to victimhood. Susan lives alone and is unwilling to let anybody into her life, but this man is the first person in the hospital, aside from Liz, to treat her with respect and wants to know more about her life. If she doesn't give, she doesn't get out, and so she cautiously opens up and tells him what he wants to know. In return for her vulnerability, he stabs her to death and carries her down to his gallery in a body bag, intending to make her his latest display. For what it's worth, I would have let you go if it wasn't for Liz. the hospital isn't just in the degrading bureaucratic nonsense. It goes beyond the gore gallery in the basement too, though putting the husks of overworked or mentally struggling humans on display after being romantically painted and posed is kind of… yikes. It's inherent in the power that Dr. X has over his department. His art reflects this vulnerability in his models as each of them sought comfort from him, and once their guard was down he butchered them for his own perverted sense of beauty. When Susan wakes in his gallery, he has a victim tied up and screaming just for him, and blindfolds himself to focus purely on the sounds of pain. He claims that this is true art, and dances to her screams as he hits her. Considering he's a therapist, this perversion of listening underlines the pleasure he takes in drawing out the pain from other people, and the power his profession gives him, a noble psychopath. This probably isn't the most encouraging portrait of therapy for Susan to see, but her rage at her captor actually drives her forward and fuels her to take action rather than sinking back into a comfortably detached depression. If Susan had contacted the police after her ordeal, she would have been dismissed as a lunatic, escaped from the psych ward, and would likely have been brought back against her will. Later on when she's kidnapped by the pest control man, she actually does try to call the police, who see she's recently been treated for her mental health, so they furnish her with the hospital reception number and leave her to die without a second thought. To survive the mental health system, she needs to be quiet and compliant until they're convinced she's no longer a threat to herself, and even then her record's permanently stained. Moving from social isolation back into society is crucial to Susan's recovery, but it's more than the hospital can handle. As she frees Dr. X's prisoner, Susan gives her identity as the Cat Lady, following Liz's musing that maybe real heroes always leave before their identity's revealed. They call me the Cat Lady. Now get out of here. Call the police. Part 3. A change of routine. Navigating the third chapter is a nightmare. Literally. Okay, not literally, but most of the game isn't entirely literal in all likelihood. 
I doubt if Susan got a serial killer's connection app, she'd find five local Splattergoons in her area. But I digress. Susan finally returns to her safe, if somewhat mouldy, haven of a flat, and just lives her life. I used to call this chapter The Sims Bit, and it's helping Susan struggle to navigate everyday life. Simple enough, right? Well, not when her mental health is fragile enough that any little thing might just tip her over the edge into a panic attack. The main goal of this segment is to avoid a breakdown, and it is hard. Unless you already know which events to do in which order, it's near impossible to get Susan a restful night's sleep rather than sobbing on the floor, and that's kind of the point. You don't know what seemingly inconsequential action will set her off, and to a degree, neither does she. Getting money for the electric meter causes her to see a pile of unpaid bills. Using milk from the fridge from before her hospital stay ruins the coffee. Going out for a cigarette means getting bothered by a crow. All these little things are upsetting, but nothing major. Another coffee can be made, and the crow can be shooed away, and bills don't need to be sorted right this second. But they all add up to more than Susan can take. She feels like every little thing is against her, and given that she was unstable enough to attempt to take her own life, she's not in a position to put these things in perspective. When you're in survival mode, there isn't any energy left for rationalising how big a problem is relative to the now. They're all stresses, and all require effort and attention to fix in many different directions. Even if logically she can recognise that it's ridiculous to be this upset about lumpy milk, that doesn't fix the coffee, or the upset at ruining it. And having emotions about having emotions can only make the problem worse, so she resumes her usual routine. Most days she stays in the flat, tries to make herself feel better, fails, and feeds the local cats. That's it. She says that she's back in her old life, and that it's as terrible as ever, but now she knows that something needs to change, or it'll continue like this forever. The Queen of Maggots may be awful, but she has given Susan a goal to work towards, and as she contemplates her new situation, the other half of this disturbance comes knocking on her door. Mitzi. Mitzi Hunt becomes Susan's roommate, and it turns out she's the one responsible for calling the ambulance that saved her life. When she'd come to inquire about Susan's spare room, she'd heard the cats screeching and picked the lock to find out what was wrong, forcing her way through the barrier Susan puts up right from the outset. The Queen of Maggots appears behind her and kisses her cheek, and Susan immediately screams at her to get out and accuses her of being a parasite, demanding to know why she's doing this to her. Given all of Susan's recent attempts at human connections, I can't say I blame her. But no, Mitzi is terminally ill. The two become fast friends, and gradually Mitzi's able to coax Susan further out of her shell and confide in her. Now, Mitzi knows she's running out of time, and has goals of her own, but always makes time to listen to Susan, and despite everything, she's relentlessly positive, without being gratingly so. She remains grounded and realistic, and acknowledges Susan's struggles, but's able to do what Susan cannot do herself. Take a step back. Mitzi breaks up the monotony of Susan's life, and helps her to connect to other people, setting her up on social media, and gets her out of the flat to search the building, which reconnects her to a lot of her neighbours. Even if she's not exactly friends with them, it adds variety to her day, and sets up the potential for new relationships. Just by being there, Mitzi prompts Susan to consider different courses of action. Okay, there was going to be a huge section here on how much I love Mitzi Hunt as a person, but it's not really relevant, but I need you to know that she's a ray of sunshine and will kick your ass. I am the greatest! <laughs> Before Mitzi, Susan's method of reaching out for company was to play the piano to attract the neighbourhood cats, even if that irritates her upstairs neighbour. Most of the soothing and sometimes lonely sounding tracks on the OST are performed on the piano. And perhaps to Susan there is an element of lost connection. Her piano was a wedding present, and if you're not careful in the sim section, she'll get spooked by her ex's shadow. He wasn't a great guy. Part 4. Stories As I mentioned earlier, the reality of the game is somewhat up in the air, and a lot is open to interpretation. Is Susan actually walking through a surreal sort of purgatory when she dies and returns? Are there actually five serial killers pursuing her? Maybe. But a lot of this world runs, like ours, on stories. Teacup the Cat is something of a local spirit in the game universe. Initially, he's Susan's only friend, and stays by her side when she initially kills herself, making sure she isn't alone in her final moments. He alerts Mitzi to Susan's overdose, watching over her during a breakdown, and yells to alert her to the pest control man parasite, even eating a parasite that invades her home later on in the game. 
Though he always comes when called, Susan notes that he never eats her food, though she continues to leave enough for him alongside the other cats. It's the act of offering that's important. He could take it any time, and perhaps if he really is more than a cat, he doesn't want to put strain on Susan, but it's key that he knows and understands that he's welcome. He wants nothing but her company, and listens to her talk about her day and her feelings, and for that, Susan's grateful. When Teacup and Susan are kidnapped by the pest control man, it's Teacup that frees her by taking her a key in his mouth after breaking out of a cat cage, mirroring the instance of Susan finding the key to the Queen's home in the mouth of her own corpse after breaking out of an ambulance. They're only taken at all because that ratty upstairs neighbour who hates cats in the building called in pest control. He threatens Susan in the middle of the night when she plays the piano, but according to Susan, he's always been a real piece of work. I don't think he meant to almost get her cannibalised, but he's definitely a bitter and angry man. Teacup slips in and out of view for most of the game, but Susan's always certain of his presence, and he protects her as well as any cat can. In taking revenge on the formerly mentioned, um, gentleman upstairs, Susan invokes the local legend of the Cat Widow. In a sense, Susan acting as the Queen's Hunter isn't too dissimilar to the Cat Widow story. Both haunt the ones that hurt them, scarred after the loss of their husbands and children, and dying only to return for their revenge. But where Cat Widow is purely out for personal revenge, the parasites Susan faces are indicative of the systematic problems she and people like her have faced. The predatory mental health consultant viewed her pain as something to tear out and display for art's sake, a personal project rather than the personal life of an autonomous adult. The pest control man hunting for meat in both a putting food on the table sense, as well as his deliberate sexual intimidation. Yes, there's a pussy joke in the cat lady, go figure. Seriously though, his predatory manner is very unsettling, especially as Susan is tied down and trying to squirm away from him as he switches between paying her compliments and threatening to eat her. The only thing that stops him from playing with Susan is his shrieking wife who pours bleach down her face to prevent her husband from being attracted to her. Apparently she does that every single time. Trust issues, <laughs> that's it. Both are voiced by David Firth. Yes, that David Firth. Hello. And though his performance is unnerving, I find it thematically interesting that they're literally one unit or one voice. They don't get names or backgrounds or even any real motivation. They're defined purely by their eating habits. I mean, if you want to be technical, yeah, Gladys is named in the credits, but not in-game, bite me. They're just the pest control couple, an unnamed evil that consumes and revels in their filthy home spattered with cat's blood. As both the cats and Susan are pests to her neighbours, it's interesting to wonder which the couple view her as, human or cat? Or perhaps they just categorise any unwanted creature as pest and permissible to eat. Perhaps their dynamic of slow decay, trust issues, and the working man and housewife is meant to reflect something of Susan's previous relationship. It turns out Susan is actually a widow. She's still living in the same flat with only the memories of her family for company. And though Dr. X asks about a mysterious Eric, and Mitzi asks about a pram in the spare room, Susan just cannot face the root of her sadness. After 10 years, she just wants to be finished with the pain and grief. She's tangibly haunted as well, if you fail to put money in the electric meter before the lights turn out in the sim section, Eric's silhouette jabs an accusing finger at her from the dark. Zoe's teddy bear is still on the bed in the spare room when Susan believes she put it away. But despite her attempts to box away her past, it's still eating away at her present. We see a flashback of Susan and Eric's relationship while she's on maternity leave, and it's not a pretty picture. He complains about her paying more attention to the baby than him, and the current lack of intimacy in their marriage, though Susan tries to assure him it's an adjustment period all couples go through. She spends all day caring for their daughter and cleaning the house, but Eric doesn't see this as real work and accuses her of being lazy and using the baby as an excuse for lounging around all day. If you try to reassure him gently, he yells at her in an alcohol-soaked rant. If you try to rally against him and defend your position as an exhausted new mother getting no emotional support from her partner, he feels attacked and validated in his accusations of Susan not wanting him. Either way, Susan loses. He insists that she always runs away from her problems, hiding behind the baby or locking herself in the bathroom to cry, and so he refuses to let her go and check on Zoe in the middle of their argument. This is why Susan can't stand flowers. She'd hidden a bouquet from an admirer in Zoe's room, as she knew Eric wouldn't bother going into their daughter's room when he got home, which is fairly telling about his attitude to their child. But unfortunately, she was born with a rare pollen allergy that neither parent was aware of. 
The window was left open, and during Eric's outburst, the wind circulated the pollen, and Susan and Eric didn't hear her choking over their fight. By the time they found her, it was already too late. The fourth parasite is another ghost from that life, Susan's secret admirer who's never moved on from her. Given Susan's restrained life in the flat, it's not a huge surprise that she didn't immediately shut down the chance for an affair. He could be her way out of her failing relationship if she plays her cards right, and he promises to be a good father to Zoe. And besides, the attention's flattering, especially in comparison with Eric's drunken rages and jealousy of their daughter. You can choose to reject him, but even so, Susan can't resist keeping the flowers he sends her, a physical token of the appreciation she sorely lacks, and puts him in Zoe's room with a prepared excuse. Ten years later, the parasite has lost his voice, the only real connection he had to Susan, as he called the flat when he knew Eric would be at work. But he arrived in the present with another beautiful bouquet, before hitting Susan in the head with a hammer. This parasite breaks the overarching pattern of systemic problems, but what he personally represents to Susan is a massive drain on her life, just like the rest of them. The grief from losing her daughter, and several days later, Eric, after he drinks himself to death in the woods, has always been too painful for her to process, and so she's avoided it, just like the problems in her marriage. But it doesn't work. Her flat is still full of reminders she can't bear to let go of, and she's extremely cagey about her past to Mitzi. But when this unnamed admirer comes calling, she can't ignore it anymore. He also forces her to think about her responsibility in the whole affair. Eric was often nasty to her, as it's implied that they fight often, and this usually leaves Susan in tears. But perhaps their relationship had been better before Zoe. We only see Eric after a horrible day at work, drinking away his problems. Though it's understandable that Susan sought comfort from another person, and was beginning an affair, it must have left her with an overwhelming amount of guilt. If she'd been faithful and hadn't accepted her lover's flowers, then maybe Zoe would have lived. Maybe Eric would have adjusted. Maybe it would have improved when she returned to work and he felt less put upon to provide for the family. Maybe she would have been trapped sleepwalking through her marriage instead of an empty flat, but at least she wouldn't have been alone. There's no way to know, but Susan has all the time in the world to torment herself with endless possibilities, wondering if she even deserves to have survived. She wakes up from the parasite's attack to being tied up with Mitzi in the bathtub. In a hopeless moment of vulnerability, Susan finally shares her story and the root of her sadness. Though Mitzi's never been in a similar situation, she gives Susan the space to talk and empathises without interruption, allowing her to finally process a decade-old wound. That catharsis is interrupted by the nameless parasite returning and hanging Mitzi by her neck in the living room, feet on a chair, and demanding in a coarse scream that Susan play the piano for him. Doing so summons the cats, who run into the flat and knock him to the floor, where he pushes the chair to strangle Mitzi as they began to eat him. Susan quickly moves to support Mitzi this time, literally setting her back on her feet, before cutting the rope and the two witness the gruesome end of a decade-long haunting. They're... they're eating you. This is... I... Don't look, Mitzi. Part 5. Don't feed the troll. Okay, so that's 4 out of 5 of the promised parasites. All of them exaggerated caricatures of the types of people that have made life difficult for Susan, but we're still missing that final leech on society. And he's right upstairs. Earlier, I mentioned Mitzi having her own goals which led her to search the building. She deliberately chose to rent a room in Susan's flat because the last thing she wants to do before she dies is confront the person who convinced her partner to kill himself. Through some online sleuthing, she knows he lives in her building, she just needs to work out which flat is his. On learning that Mitzi's cancer was terminal, her boyfriend Jack looked to the internet for information and support. It's debatable how effective forums on mental health topics are in helping sufferers with their illness. On the one hand, it provides a community of people with shared experiences that actually understand the struggles of living with a particular condition, and therefore, advice comes off as authentic rather than pamphlet lip service. They're a place where people feel they can make friends without having to pretend for others' sake that they aren't struggling. 
People who are further along in the recovery process, or who have helpful coping strategies for long-term illness can offer advice or a friendly ear, and of course members can chat about anything else they like in subforums and build a network of friends, which helps to combat the social isolation of conditions like depression. There's also advice beyond what I suppose an outsider would be able to offer on a situation. For instance, self-harm forums might offer tips on proper wound care, because if you can't prevent someone from injuring themselves, or they already have, they may as well avoid infection. And it might not be safe to ask someone around them to help either, as well as any internal shame in asking. But just like a meat-based support group, they do need a moderator to step in every so often and guide people away from destructive patterns and ensure nobody's encouraging them. Forums on sensitive topics run the risk of becoming a platform for digital self-harm, where people return to pick at emotional scabs, such as a self-harmer looking at images of injuries to push them into the temporarily soothing behaviour themselves. Or they used to avoid actual damage by looking at the aftermath from someone else, but it will still trigger those familiar feelings of anxiety and self-loathing, even if the viewer doesn't actually physically hurt themselves, or it may push them to. It's unhealthy, but it is a coping mechanism, and sites with proper moderation often refuse to host triggering images, or the tips I mentioned earlier, for obvious reasons. It's an easy cycle to fall into, and without effective moderation, people needing to be heard can turn into a suffering competition to feel validated as the worst case. And of course, trolls can sneak in for a cheap power trip from the safety of their keyboard. Which is where we come to Adam. Adam is a troll, feeding depressed people's anxieties and validating their feelings of self-loathing, encouraging them to embrace death as their lives will never improve. He sounds a lot like the black pillars on Reddit posting suey fuel content that confirms members' beliefs that they're unlovable, will never be happy, and should therefore kill themselves. It's the only logical solution. I've only heard of this happening on the incel side of Reddit, but it sounds so dangerous. People only flock to these sorts of subreddits and forums to feel accepted by others in their situation. They post pictures of themselves, asking what others think, what it is about their appearance that makes them so unattractive to women, knowing full well that their face will be picked apart. But why? Because they're insecure and anxious, and if they were told straight that they're being silly about this and that they're perfectly fine, then that feels to them like a dismissal and a demand for them to be quiet, that their problems don't matter. Again, they need to be heard. They want to be understood and validated, so they ask for criticism as that meshes with their worldview, but that pushes them further into despair and deepens those insecurities, and the cycle continues until they either leave the forum, or take the troll's advice. Mitzi says that Adam's posts give their readers a reason to die, and then tells them how to do it. To die on one's own terms, rationally and clear-headed, embracing it, seems like something a troll would tell a terminal cancer patient to do. But Mitzi doesn't bite. Jack does. Mitzi makes peace with the idea of dying, and therefore decides she'll make the most of the time she has left, and is grateful for the good things she's had in her life. But Jack concentrates on what he will lose. He can't fathom living without his girlfriend, and so he makes her illness his problem, one that he desperately wants to solve, but can't, and so decides to remove the problem altogether. Adam sees his desperation and feeds into it, enjoying the influence he can have over strangers' lives, especially as he has so little control over his own. Mitzi knows not to feed the troll by not giving him attention, but once his idea is planted in Jack's head, his anxieties nurture that seed until it blossoms into his final solution, gassing himself and Mitzi in his car. Adam even provides print-out posters to warn people discovering the various suicides he devises that there's toxic gas at the scene, so no innocent bystander who hasn't embraced his philosophy gets hurt by the fumes. He doesn't want random suffering. He wants specific, orchestrated deaths proven to be caused by him. Both Adam and Susan have titles or handles to hide behind, the Eye of Adam and the Cat Lady. But where Susan uses her anonymity to make a positive difference whilst protecting her identity, Adam's becomes his identity. When Susan and Mitzi find him in the flat, they discover how physically powerless he is. Adam is completely paralysed, aside from his eye, which he uses with a motion tracker to type on a keyboard and move his wheelchair. It's a sickening realisation to find that the villain we've been building to, the destroyer of so many lives, is actually incredibly vulnerable, far more so than Susan or Mitzi. Though his condition is sympathetic, and it's easy to see why he positioned himself as a suicide preacher, his actions are still abhorrent. By preying on those who feel powerless, he can emotionally distance himself from his own anxieties, perhaps sometimes feeling a desire for death as a way out, or perhaps being told by the world at large that as a disabled man, he shouldn't be alive and taking up resources. 
fuck that. If he's the one influencing others to die, then to his mind he's clearly superior to all those weaker people who gave in, and he doesn't need to examine his own emotional motivation or confront his own biases. As Susan and Mitzi enter his home, Adam sets off a chemical reaction in his fish tank to flood the flat with the gas he's been proffering as a suicide tool. And though he's given his father a gas mask, he passes it to Susan in the hope that Adam will call off the attack to save him. Spoilers, he dies. For Mitzi to survive, Susan has to give her the mask, sacrificing her own life and dying in her arms, gently implying that she'll be back, though Mitzi doesn't fully understand and takes it as a goodbye. In the Limbo world, Susan has her final confrontation with the Queen of Maggots, who demands she blow out one last candle for her to return to life and regain her mortality, telling her she must choose between two. One is her own life, the other is a stranger's. And finally, finally, you have the chance to say no. Susan rejects the Queen outright and refuses to feed her parasitic nature. She has control over her own life and now has the perspective and support to unpick all the bitterness from her heart. She acknowledges it, accepts who she was and is, and then lets it go. Down to her last life, Susan wakes up to a distraught Mitzi, and the two ready themselves to confront Adam. Mitzi pulls a gun on him, and he encourages her to shoot, but Susan quickly tries to talk her down as she notices the hissing of leaking oxygen canisters around the room. Remembering Liz's hospital gossip about a woman on oxygen who lit a cigarette and burned in bed, she realises that Adam is attempting to goad Mitzi into killing all three of them. He set the stage for another group suicide, and again tries to rope Mitzi into killing herself and the person she's closest to in the world. The only way to stop her from shooting is to convince her that you care, and that giving up her life for revenge on Adam isn't worth it, and she's far too important for her to lose. Regardless of your choices, Susan will survive, and she starts a blog as the Cat Lady, posting about her experiences and the ups and downs of her life. In all but the golden ending, Mitzi dies from her cancer, or from exploding the room that Adam lives in, but sparks the start of Susan's online community when Susan finds her months old friend request when she finally decides to reach out to others. A little gift from behind the grave. She decides that she wants to share her life and pull others up and out of depression along with herself, and this contrasts nicely with Adam's more sinister posts. They're very special, just like you only in a slightly different way. The world is unfair, the world's painful, but you don't have to feed into that division or force that pain onto someone else. Adam made the fundamental mistake of viewing happiness as a commodity. If he couldn't be happy, then no one could. If he wanted to be happy, he needed to take it from someone else. But really, happiness isn't a cake, it's not finite. If someone gets a bigger piece one day, they're not cutting your share any smaller. And you know the best thing about cakes? You can share them. Susan accepts that her experiences, good and bad, will always be a part of her. She's more open and happier, but she's still Susan. She's still sarcastic with a biting sense of humour, and she's uncertain about the future and whether she'll ever be free of depression. But she's grown into a better rounded person. If you got the perfect ending, a flower that bent towards the sun, then Mitzi recovers from her cancer and visits Zoe's grave alongside Susan. If not, Susan goes alone to both graves and leaves a wreath of flowers for them. She's finally weeded her garden, re-examined her life and dug up all of her old pains and looked at them properly in the light. Of course, it was uncomfortable, grisly and involved mass murder, but hey, that's recovery for you. She looks up into a beautifully blue sky and reaffirms to herself that she'll get there, no matter how long it takes, and the credits roll. But then it does my favourite thing of pretty much the whole game, and ends with this. Thank you so much for watching my first video, and all the way through. It kind of got away from me a bit. Looking at all the content warnings, I probably could have chosen a less uncomfortable game for my first video, but... I love psychological horror, and a lot of people haven't heard of many of my favourite games, and I wanted to screech my thoughts into the void, so that's what this channel's going to be for. So if you liked it, give it a like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye!